you're good to go. Okay, everybody seated? Have a comfortable seat and a good viewpoint? Can you hear me now? All good. Okay, okay. So we're ready for Cal Eston Weisenberg to present his slideshow. He calls it Our Ancestors. If you were at the family reunion three years ago in John Day, Daddy gave a, a version of this. This is somewhat the same, but he has made some modifications over the last three years. So Calvin Eston, take it away. Well, here we are. I want to make a, a couple of things to say. I have a couple of things to say. First, to Linda Holland and Connie Wood, both from John Day, have put this thing on for three or four years over there, and they've done a fine job. And then Linda is the genealogist in the family. She has dug up more information on people that have been dead a hundred years than I could ever even dream of doing. And just recently, she discovered that the last one that we had on the list that we didn't know anything about was Peter's son, Albert, who uh, at the age of 30 in Portland, unfortunately took his own life. And he'd lost his job prior to that. And that was in 1901. But anyway, I'd like to start in now. And I guess I, uh, this is the flag of Switzerland. It was made from the back of a boat on one of the lakes in Switzerland. It's a white cross on a red field. And the obverse of that, the red cross on a white field, is the flag of the red, the, the national, the international red cross. It's just a reverse of the Swiss flag. We move now to von Weissenflu von and Negley. And this is the town of Gutanen, where the family originated. Uh, several of you have been there and you will immediately recognize it. It's a tightly compact little village, about three, four hundred people. And it's up in a canyon in the Alps. The elevation there is, uh, I think, about a thousand meters. Peter and Anna. That would be the great grandfather of the people of my generation. They had eight children. The first, Alexander, in 1846 to 1901, was their eldest. He came to this country. Casper died in Switzerland as a young man. And Peter, 1853 Peter, died in 1860 in Switzerland. Melchior came to this country. Johann, my grandfather, came to this country. Anna, and she is the ancestor of, any, of all the Tanner family there. For their one daughter married a Tanner, Anna married a Tanner, and the Tanner family that came, came to Oregon. And then Peter, 1866, I don't have his de demise on here, but I, Linda can tell you what that is, and I can, I think. And then Albert, the youngest, was the one that, that died in Portland. And here's a photograph of the Weissenflus. Seated in front is 1823 Peter, his wife, 1825 Anna. I've prefaced each name with their birth year. That's it. Allowed me to keep pretty good track of who was who. 1846 Alan, Alexander and 
and the, uh, the kings that are here are all descendants of Peter. And here is Peter and Albert and, and Johan. And they were kind of the, the pioneers of the family. They moved ahead of everybody else and found, found a place to go and then they get information back to the to the those remaining so they could follow. This is on Peter's homestead at Long Creek. It doesn't show you very much, but the, the youngster sitting on the horse in the lower left of the photograph, I think, is supposed to be uh, Peter or Alexander's youngest son, Walter. That's taken about a mile, a mile and a half out of the town of Long Creek. Andreas and Anna Nagali. And now Anna Nagali was the, they were the, they were the parents of Margarita, Andreas, Magdalena, Katharina, Anna, and Johannes. Now Margarita married Alexander Weissenflug. And Magdalena married Johann Weissenflug. So the, the Russian family, Arnold and Otto and, and their children, and my parents, and their siblings, and his siblings, were all double first cousins. They were first cousins on both sides of the family. Magdalena and Margarita came to Oregon. Andreas came to Oregon and died here without ever marrying in 1916. My Aunt Andy called him Uncle Andy. Katharina, And Anna, one of them went to Oklahoma and the other one to Texas. Married, and Anna married a Texan by the name of Peggy, a, a, a Swiss. Katharina married, I can't remember your last name, but they went to Oklahoma. And Johannes died in Switzerland in 1869 before they immigrated. And this is the Nagley family that immigrated to this country. The mother and father were seated in 1824, Andreas, and 1827, Anna Oswald. And Margaretha is sitting there, though she's the one holding the baby. Now they had a tragedy. Margarita and Alexander had nine children altogether. Five were born in Switzerland. Two of them died over there before they immigrated. They had an infant son, about a year old, or maybe less than a year, that they brought with them, who died aboard ship. And they didn't want to have the child buried at sea. So they hid the corpse in a steamer trunk and brought it with them to Baltimore. And I, I read one account where Margarita put the corpse over her shoulder and covered it with a blanket and walked through customs. We don't know where the baby was buried. They, they landed in Baltimore and their destination was Kansas. So the Corpse, I presume, was buried someplace between one or the other. And the baby sitting on their lap has to be Arnold. And Arnold has descendants here today. That's the, that's the uh, Gresham family. Sharon, Carol, and, and, their, and their children and, and, and siblings. 
This was made in John Day, the gentleman on the left is Alexander, and the one on the right is Andreas Nagley. He was a, a, a brother to, to Angelina and, and, and Margarita. Alex, now this is Alexander and Margarita. They had their nine children. And they say Alexander, 1875 to 1879, he died over there at the age of four. Rosalie came with them and landed in Kansas and died as a teenager, if I remember right. Anna married Dennis King, and, uh, the ten and then they, they had children, and one of their children married a... <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm confused here. Dennis and Anna had a, well, all the King family anyway. Alexander, 1881-1916, uh, they were married, and he's buried in Long Creek. Here was, here was the Albert, 1883-1884, that's the baby that died on the way over. And then Arnold was the first born in the, in the United States, followed by Otto and Walter and Flora. And this is a photo of Dennis and, and Anna, obviously taken at different times. And this is Alexander that died in 1916, the son of Alexander. Now this is Arnold and his bride, Effie. And I think that Arnold was the only curly-headed Weissenflu that I ever knew of. And Apparently, as a young man, he liked the looks of those curls, and he, any photo I've seen of him, he would have a hat on his head, they arranged so he could see the, you could see that beautiful head of hair. And here's a series of photographs made of, you know, at their wedding day. I got these incidentally from Ina, one of their, one of their, their only daughter. And here's Flora and Effie. Flora's the youngest, and Effie is Arnold's wife. And here's the, here's the Gresham family. And there's Ar Arnold on the left, obviously, his wife Effie behind him. And then there's Elbert, everybody called him Ed, and Ina, and Merlin. Now those three are all gone, and Ed lived to be 97, and the other two lived to be 95. So we have, I think they're just about the longevity chance of the family. A couple of us here are gaining on them a little, but we're not quite there yet. And this is, <clears throat> the Hamilton Trading Company and uh, run by a guy by the name of Bill Squeak and, and his daughter Effie married Arnold. Now here's the three American born children of, of Alexander and Margarita. That's Arnold on the left, Otto in the middle, and, and Dutch, Walter Dutch. And Walter served in the army during the First World War. And here's Otto and his sister Flora. And I'm not sure which of the other, who the, who the other lady is right now. Here's Walter and civvies and Walter in the army and the an unknown soldier that was with him as a friend of his apparently. 
Johan and Magdalena. Casper Holland was the oldest, born in Kansas. Edgar, in 87, born in Fox Valley, just over the hill from Long Creek. Followed by Frank and Amanda and Ethel and Garland. Garland was my father. They were all, those, those five were born in a little cabin, which I'll show you a picture of, in Fox Valley. And Bill, William Carl, 1903, uh, has descendants here today also. He was born on the, the uh, farm on north of Long Creek. Here is Johan and Magdalena on their wedding day in, in 1884. I want you ladies to take a look at her waistline. Can you imagine the torture of those old horses? Here's the cabin where they lived from 1886 to 1901. And, and five of the seven kids were born there. There's another photo, another couple of photos of the same building. Pretty small. The, the little attic up there it had to have been a bedroom for some of them. My Aunt Mandy told the story. She was born in 1892. And my dad was born in 1900. And my Aunt Mandy told me one time that when my father was born, Aunt Mandy was the only attendant that Grandma had when she had my dad. She was an eight-year-old youngster, and her mother had had several children before that, so she knew how to have a baby. And she told the 18-year-old kid what to do, and the kid did it. And here's the schoolhouse. And that's my Uncle Ed there. And uh, that schoolhouse is about a mile from, from the homestead cabin that we just looked at. <clears throat> it's gone now. It's completely gone. It brought it down. And then here's the same cabin, and this is my Uncle Cap there, that's Casper. A one room log schoolhouse. And I made this photograph of it about 30 years ago. And I went back later and it was gone. Now this is their farm over north of Long Creek. Uh, Bill was born there, but that would be Lisa's grandfather. Lisa's here today. And the four of us were born there. Uh, Bill was born there, and Fern's two oldest kids, Edra and, and Fern, were born there, and I was born there. And here are the five brothers. Standing on the left is Frank. Bill is in the middle, my father on the right, Ed seated on the left in front, and Cap in the right. And I think this was taken about the time that Ed left to go to serve in the Army in 1918. My dad was born in 1900, as I told you, and that war ended over there again on the 11th of November of 1918. And his birthday was the 30th of November, so he was going to have to register for the draft on the 30th, and the armistice came along on the 11th, and he never did have to go. Here's my aunt, or my grandmother and her vegetable garden. <clears throat> now, she raised a preposterous amount of garden produce in that place. And she loaded it on a buckboard, most of it, and hauled it 10 miles up the road to a mining village and sold the produce to the miners, and that was constituted the bulk of their cash income. She'd come home and garden that stuff and then get a load of it and go to, go to Galena. And this is, this is what would pass as a 
half-ton pickup truck from the 19th century. It was known as a buckboard. It was also known as a hack. It was, was spring-mounted. There was spring on the frame that supported the box, and it had a little cargo box behind that seat. And that's my grandmother sitting up there, and that's her old horses. And there's the five brothers again in, down in the garden. From left to right, it's Cap and Ed and my father and Bill and Frank. Now, Bill was the youngest, born in 1903, and he appears to be a teenage kid there. So I said, Nina's Garden circa 1920, and that's my guess as to when the photo was made. Here was uh, the farewell, the farewell uh, gathering when Ed left to go in the army. Nobody had much of a happy face on them right then. And there's Johan and Magdalena in their middle years. And here's Magdalena on the right, Amanda on the left, and their two oldest girls, Fern and, and Edra. Now, Fern was born in 1912, and Edra was born, I think, in 1916. Now, she appears to be a girl four or five years old, so around 1920 again. And this was, I remember a little bit about, I have a vague recollection of this one. Uh, the gathering of the family, now standing in the front row of the two older women, the one on the left is my grandmother, and the one on the right is her sister Katie, who was up from uh, Texas for a family visit. And I think the year was 1927. And from left to right, standing, is Ed with his face partially hidden behind his wife Florence, and that's their daughter Edna standing in front of him. Standing next to Ed in the back row is my father. My mother is in front of him, and she's holding my brother Bud, and I'm standing on the ground in front of them. And I say 1927, I would have been four, and my brother would have been two. Standing next to there is my grandfather, Johan, and the face right behind his is their youngest son, Bill, and his wife, Bertha, is, her face is kind of hidden behind Magdalena. No, her face is between, between Magdalena and, and uh, Catherine, or, or Anna, and Bill is holding Charles, and Charles appears to be about a year old, and he was born in 26. So I think I have that about half right. And then the last family on the right is, is Nona and her husband Frank and their daughter Nelda. And Merle hadn't been born yet. And I think this is the last photograph that was made of Johann and Magdalena. The car, I think, was about a 1925 or 26 Chevrolet, and it belonged to Bob Crowley, and that was Amanda's husband. <clears throat> I made this photo up, up on the hill, viewing down toward the ranch, or you see a couple of buildings down there on the lower left of the photo. <clears throat> the big canyon down below is the middle fork of the John Day River, and the mountains in the back are the Greenhorns, part of the Blue Mountains, that lay between John Day and Linda Grant. And this is the house. I made this photograph also about 30 years ago, and not long after that, the fellow that owned the property was burning some rubbish around there, and the fire got away from him and burnt the old house down. But I was born in that house. <clears throat> there it is again. I showed you this picture before. But right here in the foreground, in dead center and just out a few feet in front of the camera, 
You see a good sized rock there that kind of stands up above all the rest of it. Uh, I went there some few years ago and found that rock and took this photo and everything is gone now. And those two trees that are there are, are still there. And you go, oh, go, no, no, I went out the wrong direction. I'll back up. Those two trees are in this photograph. One is right there inside the curve in the fence and the other one down the hill that I was taken in, uh, when they were out of foliage. Apparently in the late fall and everything was dried up. And the, the little building on the extreme right was the original cabin that was there and they used it for a hen house. And we go, I go to this next slide and my pickup truck is sitting about where that hen house was. This is my son Greg standing in the cellar, and the cellar, what's left of the cellar, and the cellar was right out in front of the house. Casper and Ellen, Ward's parents. Casper's homestead. He made that water wheel. And I asked Ward several years ago what he ran with that water wheel. He dug about probably three-eighths of a mile, maybe a half a mile of ditch out of a creek that's around the, around the hill to the left of this photograph to get a water supply. And he ditched that water around, and that horizontal structure above the wheel is just a, a trough that he made out of out of poles, I think, to carry the water out and that, and all of that row of square items that are on the outside of that wheel are kerosene cans. They bought kerosene in five gallon cans and the can was about a big square and about so high it would help five gallons. And people would use those tin cans for everything and he saved up a bunch of them and built that wheel and mounted those cans on the wheel so the water pouring out of that trough would fill the cans and make that side of the wheel heavy and cause it to turn. We don't know what he ran with it. Trevor didn't know and Ward didn't know and now nobody knows. But his house was the building on the right here and his barn was the one further down the hill. And there it is from a different picture, the barn on the right and the house on the left. And their garden spot is between. This is just another, you can see the wheel from a distance. It's up in the upper left-hand corner. Here's Cap with a sled that he obviously made. A pair of team of horses on it in the middle of the winter. The next one says, reads, it reads, feeding cattle on March, on the, of May. on the 14th of May, or the 3rd of May or something, of 1917, so that was 100 years ago this year. He had a snowstorm there and he scattered a little hay out for those cattle beans. A good place to feed cattle on snow. They get good, nice, clean hay. Now there's Ellen's garden, and I think Treva told me that that is Elris there with her. And they undoubtedly irrigated that garden out of the water that came out of that water wheel. This is Treva. She had a kind of a power on that day. And I got a dictionary definition here, it said a ragamuffin, a freckle-faced boy wearing a floppy hat and bib overalls. And there's a photograph of that ragamuffin 
and his two sisters and their first cousin and that ragamuffin are sitting right there. <laughs> You're looking good, boy. <laughs> and this is Ward's dad, Casper, standing in the back, and their aunt Katie in Oklahoma. And the girl, the standing girl by a calf's shoulder, the teenage girl, is, is uh, Ella. She was a downer. And then Katharina was Magdalena's sister. And the two boys in front are my Uncle Bill, Weissenflu, and my father. My father is the one standing beside her, and, and Bill is sitting on the arm of her chair. And then Flora Lowner, it looks like to be at 10 or 12 years old, maybe eight or nine, standing beside. But that was in Oklahoma. And Treva told me that Cap, at that particular moment, had the mumps, and his lower jaw was all swollen up. I, pre I, I would treasure that picture of, of those kids, especially my father. And look at that get-up that he's wearing. <laughs> look at the shoes. Everybody, nobody here, other than two or three of us, knows what a button hook is. But you have to hook, you have to... Uh, fasten those shoes with a button hook. You had a loop on one side and a hook, a hook on the other, and you, you thread the button hook through the loop and over the hook, and, and then you give it a twist and, and it puts the loop over the, and it fastens the shoe to your foot, and you'd use it to take it off, and you get ready to take them off. Here's Ed in Florence while Ed was in the Army. And there's Ed again in the army with a cigar stuck in his face. And here's Ed and, and another fellow from Long Creek by the name of Wes Harriman. Ed's the one that's seated with a hair parted in the middle. And here was Ed's ranch a mile north of Long Creek. The house, he sold it to a fellow by the name of Frank, uh, Jack Frank and and French moved the house across the creek from where it's sitting, sitting here. And this is Ed's wife, Florence, and there's Florence's mother and Edna. Now Edna, I think, was born, in, I'm not sure, 1920. So she was three or four or five years old there. And here's an unknown woman on the left, and Edna and Florence. And the car was Ed's 1923 Model, Model T Ford. Here's Oral and Edna. Oral's daughter is here today, Patty. There's Frank, and I think that was taken on his wedding day. And there's Nona. I'll stop here for a second. Uh, Nona is a descendant of Peter of uh, Clem Blackwell, and my mother is a descendant of Clem Blackwell. And three of the wife's and flew brothers, Frank and Bill and my father, all married into the Blackwell family. So we we are related on both sides of the house. Here is Frank standing on the right, and Alfred, or, you know, Alfred Tandler seated on the lower left, and the other two fellows were men that I never knew. And here's Frank again, wearing a pair of mohair chaps. And anybody that's ever worn those things knows that when they get wet, they soak up a lot of water, and they, they have a rather pungent an unpleasant aroma. Look at the stirrups on the saddle. Those are oxbow stirrups, and you never see them on a saddle anymore. And there's the Criswell kids. That was 
Matty on the yeah, left, left to right, the one of the white blocks seated is Matty. She married a man by the name of Sloan, and then another man by the, after he passed on, another man by the name of Weimer. And then Elva, she's standing behind. She's Connie's great grandmother. And Nona is the one on the, standing on the right, and then their kid brother, Bob Criswell, in front. And here's them a few years later with uh, their parents. That's uh, Charlie Cannon and, and Elva on the, in the back, and Nona on the left, and Bertha on the, in the center. And Bertha married Bill Weissenflu, and Nona married Frank Weissenflu. And descendants of both of them are here today. And then that's our brother, Bob Criswell there. Amanda and Bob Crowley at their wedding. And there's Amanda again on that same day, quite a hat that she had. Now, this is a, Amanda on the left standing and Rose Farmer, she was Rose Tandler and she married Farmer. And Virginia is here today and that would be Jim, uh, Virginia's grandmother. And the one seated in the front is Ward's mother, Ellen, Mary Frank Weissensworth. There's the Crowley family, Bob and Amanda. Uh, Ferns on the left sitting, sitting by her mother and Chorus on Mandy's lap and Oral on Bob's lap and that's Edna standing there with her mouth open. <laughs> You'll notice that the two girls are wearing dresses made from the same fabric. Now that was commonplace in those days. They would buy a bolt of cloth and make clothes for everybody until it was gone and then they'd make, buy a new bolt of cloth. This car, it was in another earlier picture there. And that was the Crowley family car, and shortly after this, they traded it off and got a four-seater. And there's Bob with a kit, and I think that one might have been made on his wedding day. And there's Fern in two different pictures. The one on the right, she told me that she was got herself all dressed up in her mother's wedding dress. And went out and posed in this shrubbery and got that picture made. And there she is again, two different pictures. And here's Edra in the same dress in a different time in a, in a similar pose, wearing their mother's wedding dress. And there's Oral on the left and Edna on the right, and there's Ed's own 1923 Ford again. I made this photograph of the Crowley House a few miles north of Long Creek. I made that about oh, 10 or 15 years ago. And I don't know whether the house is still standing or not. Has anybody been to Long Creek lately? There's somebody waving back there. Yeah, it's still there. What did you say? Still there. It's still there. Okay. Now this is taken at the first reunion and and that's Amanda on the left, and Belle Powell on the right, and Belle was a sister to uh, Ellen, your, your Aunt, Aunt Belle there, uh, Ward, your Aunt Belle. And those two old ladies were just having a damn time talking to each other there. I see that picture. <clears throat> this is Where's Pam? There's your mom, Pam, when she was 16 years old, graduating from high school, and that's her later years, and, and, and your dad, Howard Amadon. Howard Amadon had the 
nicest spirit I ever knew in a human being. That guy saw the sunny side of everything he looked at. It was great to be around him. This is Ethel. She burned to death when she was five. They had the story that I heard, they had a, an open fire with a tripod over it and a cast iron pot hanging from the tripod and they were cooking food to feed the hogs. And somebody sent her out to stoke the fire and she caught her clothing on fire. And she ran back to the house and they beat the fire off of her and they were 11 miles from town and they swaddled her up and covered her up with butter, I guess, and sheets of clothing and hauled her to town and she died the next day. There's my father and mother on their wedding day. This is their marriage certificate. And I always kind of like this thing because I thought, well, I thought when I first saw this that Ed Woodall was the JP there on Long Creek at that time and he conducted the wedding. And Cap and Ellen were the best man and the matron of honor. some batteries for this. <laughs> but anyway, those signatures at the bottom are all written by the same hand. And Ed Woodall signed it, so I, I'm sure that he wrote all those. He wrote that, all, that, all, all the pen the long hand on that thing was written by, by one person. And I thought that he forged it and it... You gotta wait. Oh, okay. Everybody hear me now? Yep. Okay, thanks, God. Anyway, it, it appears that it was all written by one person and, and, it, and Ed, Wal Ed Woodall, the Justice of the Peace there, I think probably prepared this. And I, I accused him long after he was dead by uh, forging this, and then I found out a year later that he had actually filled one out. Now, here's the marriage certificate. And it's like in the presence of Casper and Ellen, and each signature now is different. So this said, this is a, the original, and I think Linda dug this up someplace. I, I haven't had that for a long. And there's my father on the left, and and Fern in the middle, and Bill on the right. And Fern was born in 1912, so she was four or five years old there, so this is 1917 or thereabouts. And there's Bill and my father and Guy, well, one of the Hagees, I don't know which of it. Anna's family from Texas. The old dog there, I remember that old dog, his name was George. 
There's a guy named here named George too, who's a pretty good guy. <laughs> but this dog was a rattlesnake killing machine. This is rattlesnake country that we were living in here. And that old dog would kill a rattlesnake. He wouldn't fool with the snake if the snake was coiled, but if the snake was stretched out and trying to get away, that dog would jump in and grab that snake in the middle and shake his head once, and the two pieces of that snake would land 10 feet apart. And then he would attack them one after the other in turn until there was nothing left of little short chunks of dead snake. And I unfortunately had to witness the death of the old dog. I was just a youngster, seven or eight years old. And we were at Dad's homestead cabin, and we were in the, in the cabin eating what we called supper one night. It was dinner. And the old dog set up a ruckus outside. And the only time he ever stirred up a ruckus was if there was a snake there or somebody was coming. I went out there and he had a snake cornered by the top of a tree that had been felled. And Dad went and got a garden hole to kill the snake and came back and, caught, and the dog was back barking at the snake and staying out of reach and, and Dad called the dog back and the dog turned his head and the snake struck the dog and bit him on the upper lip and killed him. The dog died that night in the creek. There's my mother doing what she loved to do. That's the only good picture I could ever get of her. Every other one I ever, I sneaked that one. She was looking at whatever she had in her hand there, and I said, hey, Mom, and then I clicked the camera. And if the sewing machine she was using didn't say singer on it, she didn't want it. There's my mother and her three wives and three kids. She remarried after Dad died, and, and she and Archie had a son. We're stepping back in time now. Seated down below is my mother on the left. She was in, this is, these are all grammar school kids. And there's Ellen, the teacher, on the right. And you can see a couple of girls sitting together there wearing skirt and dresses made of the same material. There's four or five Blackwell brothers in there, and some more that I don't know. But that was probably around 1919, 1920. And you see the, those girls, there's three of them there, or four that are all obviously 13 or 14 or 15 years old, and you wonder why they're still in, in the grammar school. And in those days, very few of the kids ever took eight grades in succession. They would lay out a year here and a year there to stay at home and work on the farm. And a lot of those kids came out of school old enough to shave. Here's a, the girls of a, about that same time. There's Ellen on the left, and she was the teacher. My mother standing next to her. And there's three girls in a row that came out of one family, all wearing the same pattern. And the little girl in front is Elris, and that little pole toy is something that Uncle Cap built for her. And because they hadn't invented daycare yet in that part of the world, the teacher took her toddler to school with her, and kept her busy somehow while she taught the kids their ABCs. And uh, speaking of ragamuffins, there's another one. I'm guilty. <laughs> and there he is again on the left, and my kid brother on the right, and, and that was at my dad's homestead cabin, and that snowball bush, my mother moved that thing at least four or five times that I can remember. She took that thing with her wherever she lived. And there's yours truly again, and my brother, in the spring of 1943, I had just finished boot camp in the Marine Corps. That's Edna standing between us. My brother went in the Navy just a few weeks after that. 
And there's the Irish princess. She did that seven days after I married her. And I couldn't hardly get out of bed, but she got out and killed a deer. Her first one. And that was at Uncle Bill's cabin, and there he is again. And, and a mare that we bought from her, I bought from her Martin's brother. I rode that mare to high school for three years. And we rented a barn in town. We rented space in a barn. There was a lady in town that Long Creek had individuals in town had their own milk cows. No dairy around anywhere. If you wanted milk, you had to have a cow. And this lady that had a cow, a cow barn in her backyard <clears throat> allowed us to bring a, hay, a wagon over hay to town and I'd ride the old pony to town and down to the barn and she had a closed barn off with a watering trough in it and I'd pull the saddle off and take the, the bridle and everything off the horse and turn her loose and throw a hay bundle out for her and a handful of oats go to school, and then I'd come back, and when school was out, saddle her up and go home. They hadn't invented school buses in that day. And that, that year that she had that cold, I had to quit riding her about the 1st of April because she was too far along in her gestation period, and I, I walked that four miles to high school. And there's my kid sister and I, and you can see the date on the license plate was 1937. She was four, and I was 14. And there she is again on her wedding day to Jim McAllister. Jim is from, from Chicago. And there they are again. Uh, the youngest one in front, that's their, their two kids standing in the back, Tim and, and Tracy, and, and that's Tracy's son from, from her first marriage. And here's Ron and Neva and my sister Helen and her husband, and that would be Tim's oldest boy, I guess, Joseph. Maybe Neva can tell me, is that right? Is that Joseph or Joshua? Joseph. And there's the last picture I took of Helen. She passed on in 2007 at the age of 73. This is Bertha, <clears throat> Lisa's grandmother, dressed up in her best bib and tucker and she was probably 10 or 12. And there's Chuck and an old dog, and I think, I think this, was, this was made in Idaho, I think, at American Falls. Well, look at those cars. And here is Chuck again, sitting on his dog, and that collar has studs on it so that the dog didn't get eaten up by some other dog. And I remember hearing the old folks in the family tell about that little boy. If they decided they had to apply a little corporal punishment, which was commonplace in families in those days for misbehavior, that they had to do it somewhere not in the presence of that dog because he wouldn't allow anybody to hurt that kid. So they could leave that kid with that dog and rest assured that the kid would be fine. <laughs> Every youngster ought to have a dog like that. The Tanner family. That, you know, in the original photo we looked at, Peter and his family, one girl, Anna, she married Andreas Tanner. And they had Henry and Alfred and Rose and George and Alphenius and Josephine and Dewey. And Rose married a man by the name of Sid Farmer. And uh, they had three or four children. And one of Rose's granddaughters is here today. And that would be 
Virginia Whiting. Henry had a son by the name of Rule, R-U-E-L. Rule was born the same year I was, and I don't know whether I'm older than he or vice versa. But after World War II, he moved to, to Ohio. And uh, if he's still living, he and Ward and I would be all that's left of, the, of the, uh, that generation. And if he's gone, it's just Ward and I. And with, within the Weissens rules, it is down to Ward and I. There were 14 of us to start with. And now it's down just to the two of us. And there's the Tandler family. Uh, yes, that's Andreas on the left. That's, and that's Henry standing in the back. And of course, Anna. And again, look at the fabric on the dresses of those girls. And that's Rose on the right. And Josephine sitting on Anna's lap. And there's that, that, that doesn't. And then there's one more there sitting in the, in the lower left. The younger one, and that would either be George or Alphenius, and we don't know who which one. And I think Dewey was the youngest, and Josephine was the next to the youngest, and she looks to be a pretty young kid. So I don't think Dewey had been born yet when this family, when this photo was made. There's Sydney and Rose. Now they had four. Julius is Virginia's father. And this is how you went to church. You got dressed up in your best bib and tucker. Look at the hats that those girls were wearing. The wind blow that hat off, the gentleman had to pipe them off and go gather it up. You notice one oddity about that photo. The uh, man on the the furthest to the left there, his horse has no head. And there's a blurry spot down close to his foot. And about the time that photograph was taken, that horse threw his head, as they often do. And in those days, the shutter speeds of the cameras were pretty slow and it didn't capture much. But that Sid and Rose Farmer on the right, and Otto Weissenflu is the other man, and I think that the woman on the, to his right, on the extreme left in the photograph, would be his wife, and her name was Alta Steach, and I don't know who the woman is in the middle. Again, this is a, this is a little better picture of the half-ton pickup truck of the late 19th century. They were, had a, a double leaf spring under each end of it. They're quite comfortable riding. And that's Casper Weissenflu and Otto and Henry Tanner, all first cousins. And there's Julius. I made that photograph of him the last time I ever saw him. He came through town on his way to, from Virginia's house and going over to see Leola, and he stopped in Bend overnight, called me up. And I went down to his motel and picked him up and took him out to the bus stop and we sat there in Gab for about an hour before his bus left. That's the last time I ever saw him. He was a great guy and I loved him like a brother. And there's Leola. And there she is again. Now we depart the Weissen flows briefly, and I'll ask the indulgence of those that are not related. These, these are the Blackwell pioneers. That's, your, that's Clem and Jenny. <clears throat> now Jenny was the daughter of a Cherokee Indian lady whose name was Singing Water Mahala. I'm sure that the singing water portion of her name was given to her by the tribe. She married a white man by the name of Samuel Morris, and the white people gave her the name Mahalo. 
I'm wearing this necktie in remembrance of her. The tie was given to me by a Klamath Indian lady about a half a century ago. In fact, the year was 1958, a little more than a half a century ago. And it's one of my prized possessions. But that's my great-grandmother. And that's, you, that's John Black, or Clem Blackwell, and as I said, three wives and flus married into the Clem Blackwell family, and there's descendants here of, from all three of them today. Uh, Singing Water Mahalo has had her recognition placed on a, the honor wall in the National Museum of the American Indian. I had a little to do with this. There's a, a lady, uh, one of the black relatives in Bend, who had a, a daughter li living in, in New York. And uh, the daughter in New York got this done. And I guess we'll wrap this up with that, folks. And I've, I've got, I think, one more, got one more slide here. So that's, that's it. Now, some rather extreme hearing loss and I have very a lot of difficulty handling uh, voice from children and from ladies and uh, I'm not hear men's voices very well so I'm going to get me a helper up here and, and he's going to grab the questions that he gets from any of you and then he will, he will whisper in my ear so I'll come close where I can hear it. So where's, where's David? That's my top grandson. <laughs> you gotta got be a man to be a cop these days. Gotta be something. <laughs> okay, open for questions.
Johann's first job was cutting hay with a scythe in Prey City, I think. And then they moved to Fox shortly after that and built that new house and, and lived there for, for uh, about 80, 87, 86, 87 to uh, 1901 when they moved over to the Oak Gap Ranch. There's a bunch of Weisenflus in Minnesota that uh, spell the name with two S's. Do you know if they're part of this uh, There have, uh, when I was in Switzerland, uh, Adrian told me that he, if there was one branch of the family more closely related to him than we are, that had a 12, he said one family with 12 children immigrated to the United States and they never heard from them again. Now I've looked in phone books. You go to Minnesota, you go to Illinois, you go to to Pennsylvania, and you look at phone books and you'll find license pollution. There was a family in Portland one time that uh, were license pollution. And in Attila, there was a few license pollution. One time, this would have been in the early 70s, I was at Sun River and uh, stayed at the hotel and the young desk clerk, he says, Weissman Blue, and I said, yes, he says, my name is Weissman Blue. And uh, I asked him where he's from, well, he's from Tilderbuck. Another time I was in Lewiston, Idaho, back in the mid early 50s, or early 60s, and uh, got gas in a gas station, I had the guy a credit card. He says, your name is and Blue? And I said, yes. He says, so is mine. So there are a few scattered around the country. We're not by ourselves. Interesting. Um, how long did Cal serve in the Marine Corps and then his brother in the Navy? How long did he serve? How long were you in the Marines and how long was your brother in the Navy? Uh, I went to the Marines in March of 1943. And I got paid off in February of 1946, so just a few weeks shy of three years. Another thing, Ward and I were in the Marines, both of us. And our paths crossed for the first time in San Diego in 1943, right after we got out of boot camp. And then he shipped out to Hawaii. He went to a some kind of a training school will last a few weeks first, and then he went to Ukiah, went to, to Hawaii, and then a month or two after he went out to Hawaii, I went to the same base in Hawaii, but we were different outfits. Ward was in the third wing, were you not? What did he say? Headquarters. Third wing headquarters? Headquarters. Okay, well I was in the base headquarters. Now, our position, was analogous to the a ship's company on an aircraft carrier. We ran the machinery, the control tower, and, and, the, and the mess halls and all that stuff, and, and provided a facility for other units to move into and through and out of. And he was on one side of the field and I was on the other in different outfits. And then after the war was over, when finally the Japanese lifted in, we came back to the States and we were working in the same office. <laughs> so our paths were parallel right up to the very end. And he got paid off one day before I did. He got out on the 28th of February and I got out on the no, 28th of the 31st of January and I got out on the 1st of February. We were both sergeants, by the way. Cool. Our, our name used to be preceded with a Vaughn. Yes. What was the Vaughn? The Vaughn prefix on the name. Where, where did that go? In, in most German-speaking countries, the word, first of the word Vaughn, V-O-N, translates to from. That's the English equivalent. So. Calvin from Weissenflut. 
Now, some, uh, and, and the most German-speaking countries, Switzerland accepted, most German-speaking countries, the bond indicates nobility. Somebody back there was a duke or, or something, a baron maybe, and, and then the, the lesser members of that family want to ride on the grandeur of the nobility in the family, so they would say, we are from that nobility. And then and I got to Switzerland and I asked Helga, I says, who were our noblemen? And she says, in Switzerland, the bond sometimes means nobility and other times does not. And she said, in our case, it does not. <laughs> high school the year the Depression ended in 1940. And I never had a nickel in my pocket all the way through. And one of these sessions somebody asked me if I ever dated a girl. I said, hell no, I never had enough money. And that's the truth. <laughs> People that didn't live that Depression don't understand how, how hard scrabble it really was, but getting your hands on money was a real chore. 
A few people had some, but, but not many. And our family didn't have any. All right, I think we're going to pass the mic over to Auntie Dawn now. Uh, grab us up here. Oh, I got one more thing I want to say. Oh, well, you're the man. Just <laughs> illustrate the depression. I've got a check stub at home that was left from some of my dad's stuff. And for one two month period in 1933, and that was the year my sister was born, my parents wrote checks at a grocery store in the sum total of $21 and some odd cents. The rest of what we ate came out of the chicken house, out of the pig pen, out of the garden. My mother canned 400 quarts of fruit every year. We hung the meat in the smokehouse when you put the hogs. We'd, we'd kill five or six hogs every fall. And smoke that meat and put quite a lot of salt on it. And that meat would hang in that smokehouse until we ate it. We had no electricity. We had fresh milk every day, twice a day. I know how we got it. <laughs> but after my dad passed away, I was the guy, I was the official cow milker in our family. Ward grew up milking cows. His dad made a living for the first several years milking about 30 head cows. And Ward and his kid sisters went out and milk cows every morning before school and every, every evening after school. Right, Ward? Yeah. And they sold that milk to a creamery, and creamery made the one most of it into butter. Their milk and Mikhail went to Hepner, Trevo told me. And on ours, we, we saved whatever cream we didn't have and just dump it in a five gallon cream can. When the cream can got, well, it sit there for four or five days until we got it filled up. So we would run the milk through a separator and feed the skim milk to the hogs and, and, run a, and take the cream and whatever fresh milk we wanted to use in the kitchen and uh, make butter out of, out of the cream. And when we didn't, we only made the butter that we wanted and then the, when the cream can filled up, that went, it was hauled to town in a wagon and, and uh, put on a mail stage and sent to John Day and they would run through their creamery and make butter out of it. By then it was spoiled, but you could still make butter out of spoiled cream. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. so much, Daddy. I never tire of hearing these stories about the family. I see people nodding. I just It's such a treasure to have this. There are parts of my family history that I don't know on my other side, and I'm just so grateful that we have this information and that we have Daddy's written remembrances of growing up in Grant County. So the reason I wanted to take the mic, in addition to thanking my dad for doing this, was to say that this is the ideal time for us to get some group photo shots and would like to take photos by family. So I believe that either Connie or Linda has cards that identify the family. Is that, oh. Yeah, no, we forgot. Oh, okay, well, okay. Uh, give us a couple minutes to regroup and figure out what we're gonna do about that. But just be on the, on the alert that in about five or 10 minutes, we'll figure out a place and start taking photos. Thank you. <laughs> 